Okay. So if you go down and you look, you can see there are a bunch of, there's actually three different sheets. Uh, and I think the one we want to look at is the one that says still even more genetics problems. I think this is one that is good because it has all the different kinds of problems. Yeah, this one is good. Okay. So um, here it is on your screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to work each of these problems. What I would like to do, what makes it a little more efficient um, is for me to give you a little time to do it. If you've already worked it, you can look over it. Um, and, um, you know, so I'll give you like, uh, you know, five minutes for question number one or something like that, and then we'll go over it. Um, actually, we may not have time to do that with all of them because this is a pretty long sheet. Maybe we should just, maybe we should just do it all together. I think that makes more sense. Okay. So um, let's look at the first one. <clears throat> and one of the things about these genetics problems, sometimes it wants you to work backwards, you know, and this one kind of wants you to work backwards. In other words, we've done a bunch of problems where, um, you know, we have parents and we want to know offspring. This problem says in squirrels, Brown hair is completely dominant over red. So that's important. You know, we might put a big B and a little B here as our alleles. And then it says, if the F1 generation all has the genotype big B, little B, what is their phenotype? And then what must be the genotypes of their parents? So let's think about this. Uh, if all of the offspring have this genotype, if this is the F1, the first generation, um, what's their phenotype? Well, that's just saying, what do they look like? Well, if brown is dominant over red, what does this phenotype look like? It's going to be brown, right? Because brown is dominant over red. So that's easy enough. Phenotype is red. But then it says, what must be the genotypes of their parents? Well, if they all have this same genotype, then what you would assume is that you're dealing with one parent that's homozygous dominant and one parent that's homozygous recessive. And then when you figure out the alleles, this one can only donate a big B and this one a little B. Okay, so that is what you would assume. Now, as soon as a homozygous recessive squirrel crops up, as soon as a red haired squirrel crops up, that would tell you, well, this must be a little B. Right, and one of those squirrels happened to get that little bee there and this little bee. But if they're all this genotype, then you would assume we're probably dealing with a homozygous dominant and a homozygous recessive, okay? So that one's pretty straightforward. Keep in mind, this is a mono hybrid cross, right? We're looking at one trait, hair color in this case, and following it from the, in this case, I gave you the offspring and I'm asking you to work backwards, but no big deal. You can work forwards or backwards once you understand the genetics. Okay. Any questions about that one? Okay. So this next one, I will just tell you, this is as complicated as it's gonna get uh, for <clears throat> these types of problems, okay? What I'm giving you is a dihybrid cross here and one trait is incompletely dominant over the other. The second trait is completely dominant. And so I'm throwing this incomplete dominance in there, um, makes it a little more complicated, okay? Let's look at how we would set this problem up. I like to take the info out of all these words. So obviously red <clears throat> flowers, incompletely dominant over white, that's important. Up here, I'm gonna write red. I'm gonna stress incompletely dominant over white. I still have to assign alleles just like I always did, a big R and a little R perhaps. <clears throat> 
And there's a second trait. Square stems are completely dominant over round. And you might think that's kind of strange. Turns out mints have square stems. I don't know why, they just do. Mint plants have a square stem. It's one of the ways you can identify them. Okay, now it says we're crossing a homozygous dominant with a homozygous recessive, okay? We wanna know the genotypic and phenotypic ratios of the F1 and then the phenotypic ratio of the F2, okay? So let's, let's work on this. Let's set this problem up. I'm dealing with a homozygous dominant individual. We're assuming it's homozygous dominant for both the traits, okay? Um, so for this trait, if it's homozygous dominant, we're going to have two big R's and for this trait, two big S's. So here's a homozygous dominant individual for both the traits. And then it says to cross with the homozygous recessive. So these would be all little letters. So there's our parents, okay? This is what we're crossing together initially. These are the first set of parents. Now, here we have to figure out gametes, right? From the parents, we do meiosis to get the gametes. Well, because these are all uppercase letters, there's no choices. All the gametes are gonna be the same. They're gonna get one of the big R's and then they're gonna get one of the big S's. Same thing with this parent, but lowercase, okay? and then we fuse them back together. In this case, you don't really need a box. You only have one gamete here and one gamete here, and you can put the R's and the S's back together. Big R, little r, big S, little s. This is the F1. This represents, keep in mind, a generation of individuals, right? All of the plants have this same genotype and phenotype with respect to um, this particular trait. Now, here's the thing. What's the phenotype of the F1? Well, red is incompletely dominant over white. And so remember, the only thing that changes when you have incomplete dominance is the phenotype of the heterozygous individual. This is heterozygous for this trait that's incompletely dominant. So if it was complete dominance, this would be red, but it's not complete dominance, it's incomplete dominance. And so you should realize that these individuals are not gonna be red, they're gonna be pink. We're gonna get a mixing of those two traits. What about this trait? Well, square is completely dominant, so they're gonna be square. So all of the individuals in the F1 generation, mints make a lot of seeds. There could be 500 seeds. And if you planted those 500 seeds, every plant that came up would have pink flowers and square stems. This is our F1. So, it's no different than doing it with complete dominance. You just have to realize anytime you have a um, heterozygous individual for that incompletely dominant trait, you're gonna get a mixing, okay? No big deal. Now, we gotta get to the F2. How do we do that? Well, simple enough, we do a self cross, right? We cross, We cross this genotype of the F1 with itself. <clears throat> so I'm gonna clear some room here. Um, let's see. Try my big fat eraser. Oops. That works pretty good. Look at that. It's very satisfying, actually, in a strange way. Oop. Okay. There we go. Now, what are we crossing together? Well, now we're crossing, need to make a little more room. I, I wanna leave the traits up here. So I'm gonna do it right over here. Hopefully y'all can still see this. Now I'm crossing big R, little r, big S, little s with itself. Okay. And now, now we have choices for gametes, don't we? Because we have both upper and lowercase letters for this trait and same here. So it's not hard to figure out, be systematic. You could think of it like this, start with the big R and say, okay, 
a gamete might get, <clears throat> remember it's gonna have half the chromosomes. It might get the big R and the big S, there's one. It might get the big R and the little S, there's two. Could get the little R and the big S. Could get the little R and the little S. So there's four gametes from this parent that are possible. Now it should make sense to you since this individual has the same genotype as this individual, it can make the same gametes. And so, you know, we're gonna get exactly the same gametes for this parent. We can, I don't have a lot of room, so I'm not gonna draw them out, but you get the idea. So now we have four gametes for one parent. We have four gametes for the other parent. Now we can draw our box. And remember what decides the shape of the box. Oops. Uh, what's happening? What decides the shape of the box is the number of gametes for each parent. I want to make sure I have enough room to fill in the box. So I'm going to leave a little space. Now here's really hard to draw straight lines like this, but I'm doing my best. Boy, that's horrible. Look at my box. It's terrible. Okay. And now same thing for this parent, big R, big S, big R, little S, little R, big S, little R, little S. And now let me see if I can do a little better. That's a little better. Not so bad. This line is just wonky. We'll straighten it out. There we go. There's our box. Now, I'm going to tell you, I get a lot of times students will get the gametes and then they'll give up. Don't give up at that point. Just draw the box. It's not that hard. Now we're going to fill in each box, right? We bring the R's and put them together and we bring the S's and put them together. So these come over and these come down. Something like this. And here's where penmanship really kind of matters. And I'm, I'm not so good at it, but if you can try to be a little neat, it's helpful when you're doing this. It's also helpful to make, if you have upper and lowercase letters that look the same, make one different, like I'm making the S different with a line in it so that I can tell them apart. And even still, sometimes we get confused. Okay, beautiful. So there are 16 boxes. Now you'll notice the problem only asks for the phenotypic ratio of the F2. Here's all of our genotypes. You know, you've, you've basically figured out the genotypes, just not the ratio, and that's fine. <clears throat> so now here's the thing, y'all. Um, in this case, we have a third phenotype for flower color, pink, okay? So we might just take a second to think about what are the possible ways, what are the possible ways that any of these gametes might look? I'm sorry, any of these offspring might look. Well, there's a bunch of different ways they could look. They could be red and square, right? There's a possibility. They could be red and round. They could be pink and square. They could be pink and round. They could be white and square, or they could be white and round, okay? There's six different possible phenotypes. Now, did we get them all? We don't know yet. We have to go through the boxes and see, okay? So let's think about this though, particularly with the incomplete dominance. Now, if it's red, it has to have what? It has to have two big R's. But if it's square, that's complete dominance. So it has to have one big S, but it could have two, okay? So let's find the red square ones. So this one is red and square. Let's cross it out. This one is red and round, pink, pink. Here's one that's red and square, red and round, pink.
pink, 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 white, white, pink, pink, white, white. So it turns out there's only two. Oh, I missed one. Here's the third one. Yeah. So it turns out that there are three that are red and square. This one's square because it has a big S and a little s. Let me make sure I didn't miss any others. No, nope, that looks like that's it. So there's three of those ratio wise. Now, what about red and round? Well, if it's red, it's got to have two big R's. If it's round, it's got to have two little S's. That's recessive, right? Two big R's, two little S's. Let's cross these out, take them out of the equation now. We've accounted for those. Pink, pink. This one is red and round. There's one. Pink, 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 white, white, pink, pink, white, white. There's one of those. Okay. Now, pink and square, if it's pink, it's got to have big R and a little r. That makes it pink. If it's square, that's complete dominance, and that trait could have one big S or two. So there's likely going to be quite a few of these. This one's, let's cross this out. This one's pink and square. There's one. Pink and square. There's two. Pink and square. Pink and white. Pink and square. Pink and square, white, white, pink and square, round, white, white. So how many of those are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six of those. Now pink and round, it's got to have a big R and a little R. It's got to have two little S's. And I only see two of those, there's one there, pink and round, and then there's another one, pink and round, one, two. Now, white and square, now we're homozygous recessive. This is dominant, and I see three of those, right? There's, there's white and square, white and square, white and square, there's three of those. And then the last one is homozygous recessive for both traits. There's one of those. Okay. Three to one to six to two to three to one ends up being our ratio. This is the most complicated kind of a problem that you could expect to see on the test. Okay. And it's not complicated. It's not any more complicated than any of the other ones, except for the fact that you're dealing with this incomplete dominance. You have to remember that you get that third phenotype pink thrown in there when you have a heterozygous individual for that trait. Questions? Well, good, y'all. Hopefully you're understanding it. I have no way of knowing. Normally, it's so funny because normally what we would do in class, I hate to say what normal is anymore, but normally, I would print this worksheet out and we would be sitting in a classroom and I would give it to everyone. And then I would wander around from one person to the next and look at what you were doing and be like, oh, well, what about this, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, it's interesting for me to just go through the worksheet without actually even seeing you and knowing what the heck you're doing, but this is what we have to work with, so. Okay, I'm getting rid of this one. Bye-bye. Um, now we move on to blood type. Remember, blood type is multiple alleles, right? Meaning there's three different alleles, but you only get two of the three. Any two of the three is, is fair game, okay? So it says, if a baby has type O blood, what are the possible genotypes of his parents? Well, here again, I'm asking you to work backwards. This baby has type O blood. I want to know, tell me what the genotypes of his parents are. Can you eliminate any genotypes would be the first thing to think about. If a, if a baby has type O blood, the only thing you really know, well, what you know is its genotype. In this case, the only way to have type O blood is to have two little eyes, right? That means that the parents both have to have a little eye. And that means we can eliminate type AB altogether. Anyone with type AB blood cannot have a type O child, but we can't eliminate any of the other blood types uh, 
we could eliminate some genotypes, but what we can say is the parents could be I to the A little i. They could be I to the B little i, have type A heterozygous or type B heterozygous, or they could be type O. So they can be any of these three genotypes, okay, and still produce an offspring that's type O. <clears throat> it's possible. Can two parents with type A blood have a type O child? Hmm, let's see. Let's see if that's possible. I mean, this shows that it is possible, but let's, let's work it like a genetics problem. Let's say we had two heterozygous parents that are type A. Okay, well, what gametes can this parent make? It can make an I to the A or a little I. Same with this parent for gametes. We draw the box. It's a monohybrid cross. And we're going to see not only, we're going to see the ratio now of blood types that these parents would produce. And voila, there's our type O. So yes, uh, two type A's can produce a type O, assuming they're type A heterozygous. They both have to be heterozygous type A. They both have to have a little I. And it, you get this three to one ratio of type A to type O. So yes, it is possible, okay? The last one says, <clears throat> excuse me. The last one says, if your mother's type AB, and your father is type O, ah, typo, I made a typo in the typo. <laughs> I'm full of humor this morning. Uh, what are the full genotypes and blood types that you and your siblings must have? So we're crossing a type AB with a type O. Well, do we know the genotype of this parent? We do, it has to be I to the A, I to the B. That's the only way you get type AB. Do we know the genotype of this parent? We do, in fact, no. Has to be type O, okay? Cross them together, make gametes. This, this parent can make two different gametes. This parent can only make one gamete. Now we have a rectangular box because we have one gamete from one parent, two from the other. And voila, what we see is that the offspring are going to be either type A heterozygous or type B heterozygous. Please note, if you cross an A, B, and an O together, you can't get either of those blood types back out. You can only get type A heterozygous, or type B heterozygous. So it's the only two you can get back out. Okay, that gives you all sorts of variations on blood type. It's a useful uh, exercise. All right, moving right along. If you have questions, just holler. I'm here. Now this one, Annoyingly, it don't, doesn't have the ones and twos in there. One, one, two, two, one, one, two, two, et cetera, one, one, two, 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 two. The ones and twos we're gonna see in question number five become important. We'll see how that works. Okay, weight in baby chicks is controlled by multiple factor polygenetic inheritance. This is in fact true, <clears throat> believe it or not how much an egg weighs or a baby chick weighs. Okay, one chick with the genotype all big Fs. So let's write that out. Big F1, big F1, big F2, big F2. Remember, what this means is there's four chromosomes controlling the same trait. There's a pair here, and then somewhere down the line, there's another pair, and they all have the weight gene. This individual weighs 30 grams. <clears throat> if it's homozygous dominant, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> if it's homozygous recessive, 
all the way down the line. It only weighs 10 grams. These are the parameters in which you must work. The most the chick can weigh is 30 grams. The least the chick can weigh is 10 grams. I don't know what this thing is, sorry. It's supposed to be an F, but it was a two or something, I don't know, okay. Now it says, determine the weights of the following hybrids if each dominant allele increases weight by five grams. Okay, so the first one looks like this, big F, little F, big F, little F, one, one, two, two. The way to approach this is to look at this and say, if it was homozygous recessive, if it was all little Fs, how much would it weigh? Well, it would weigh 10 grams. Start at 10. And then it tells you to add five grams for each dominant allele. So we start at 10, we add five here, 15, nothing there, that's recessive. Five more is 20, nothing there, that's recessive. So this one's gonna weigh 20 grams. What about the next one? And this is interesting and important to note. One, one, two, two. How much is this one gonna weigh? Well, it's gonna weigh 20 grams. It doesn't matter where the big and little Fs are, it just matters if they're there, okay? So here we had one here and here. Here they were both on the same chromosome. It doesn't make any difference, it still weighs 20 grams. What about this next one? Little F, little F, little F, big F is <clears throat> gonna weigh, add five for this one dominant allele, it's gonna weigh 15 grams. And then the last one, we have three dominants, it's gonna weigh 25 grams, okay. These are not hard problems, the math has to work out. I have to make sure that the problem works out math-wise. It's up to you to understand that there are parameters. The most it's gonna weigh is 30 grams and the least 10. If you get numbers over or under this, you've done something wrong, okay. So be aware of that. And then be aware it doesn't matter where the dominant alleles are, it just matters if they're there or not. Okay, so this is a, these are simple problems. You just have to understand how to work them. Okay. All right, now it says, if you cross a homozygous dominant chick with a homozygous recessive chick, now clearly we can't be mating chicks together. They would have to grow up to be chickens. <laughs> You know, one of the boy chicks would be the rooster and the girl chick would be the hen, right? Let's just say they grew up and <clears throat> we have a homozygous dominant one, all big S. And we're gonna cross that with a homozygous recessive one, all little s, okay? And we want to know how much are their little baby chicks going to weigh if these if we breed these two chickens. So now, this is actually you know something that might be relevant because uh, you, there's a market for buying and selling little baby chicks, right? Uh, so now the ones and twos become important. The ones and twos are kind of like when we did a dihybrid cross, the different letters. But, but we have to use the same letter here all the way across because it's the same gene, in this case, weight, okay? So the ones allow us to figure out the gametes. And so the gametes now, rather than getting one of each of these letters, if the letters were different, they're gonna get one of each of the numbers. So this parent can make all bunch of gametes that have a big F1 and a big F2, because that's all it has. This gamete's gonna make or this parent's gonna make gametes with little f1s and little f2s. Each gamete gets one of the ones and one of the twos. Now we put them back together, just like we put the letters back together in a dihybrid cross. Now you're putting the ones and twos back together and you see we get this heterozygous offspring. And how much does it weigh? Well, we start at 10. 15, 20, so the, all the little baby chicks are gonna weigh 20, 20 grams when they're born, okay? When they hatch out. <clears throat> okay. If you can 
do this worksheet and this worksheet makes sense to you, you're in really good shape for the test because these are, you know, as complicated as the problems are going to get on the test. No tricks. Everything's pretty straightforward. Thanks for sticking with the program. We're almost done with the sheet. Okay, how come when Mendel crossed a green potted pea with a yellow potted pea, all the offspring had green pods? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Green, they all had green pods. This is green and this is yellow. What does this tell you? If, if you're crossing a green thing and a yellow thing together and everything's coming out green, it kind of tells you that you must be dealing with complete dominance, <clears throat> right? And that green must be completely dominant. So big G, big G, little G, little G, right? Everything comes out green over and over and over and over. That just means you're probably dealing with a homozygous dominant and a homozygous recessive initially. Um, granted, now you might think, well, why couldn't this be heterozygous? Well, if it was heterozygous, it wouldn't be yellow, it would be green, right? So this is likely what you're dealing with here, statistically speaking, and all of the offspring just keep getting this heterozygous condition and that makes them green, okay? This is one of the things Mendel did across, we talked about flower color, but he also looked at uh, round and wrinkled seeds. He noticed some seeds are round and some are wrinkled. And he looked at uh, pod color, um, the actual pod of the pea. Some of were some were more yellow and some were more green. So this is an actual thing Mendel did. Okay, last one. Genetically speaking, what are the odds that any given baby will be a boy, and why is that? Okay, well remember that. When you cross a boy and a girl together, a male and a female, um, the female only has an X to donate. The sperm, however, all the eggs only are carrying an X, genetically speaking, because that's all the female has. This is the female and this is the male. And the male has, it, the sperm can be carrying an X or a Y. So if you just work it like a simple genetics monohybrid cross, which is what it is, this female can only donate an X. Isn't it ironic that, who was it, King Louis or King Richard? I can't remember. One of those kings lopped his wife's head off because she couldn't bear a male heir. That's horrible because she doesn't have a Y. It's not up to her. The sperm controls the sex of the offspring. Sperm can be X or Y. Now we draw the box and we see very quickly that it is a one-to-one -one ratio. One-to-one -one girls to boys, right? So, you know, statistically speaking, you would expect there to be a 50-50 chance of having a male or a female. And if you look at statistical data over large periods of time, it basically comes out to be true. Now, just as you could flip a coin 10 times and get 10 heads in a row, that would be a statistical improbability, but not a statistical impossibility, right? The thing about this is these are mutually exclusive events. And so it doesn't matter what happened before. Each time you have the next baby, it's still a equal chance of male or female. So don't get sucked into thinking, um, <clears throat> don't get, oh, King Henry the, the Eighth, Nicole said. Thank you, Nicole. It was King Henry the Eighth. What a jerk. Jeez. He couldn't apparently produce a male sperm because that would have been what it would have taken. Okay. So don't get sucked into thinking that, you know, it matters what happens before or after because it doesn't. It's so just each event is separate from the next. So that's great that we made it through that sheet. Um, I'll, I'll 
show you that there are some other sheets. Um, I can get out of this. Let's see. Yeah, this sheet. And now you can see this was the still even more genetics problems. And this, this sheet is in there as a, uh, as a Word doc. And if you can't open it, I apologize. You can, I'll make this, uh, I can actually make this video available to everyone. So you'll have the sheet in the video. There are these other two. This one um, is just some random genetics problems that are very, very similar to the ones we just did. It's a good sheet. Uh, this other one though, the one that says more genetics problems, I should probably add, name these differently. This one is good because it has some explanations around it, you know, so it kind of tells you what's what. It talks about a monohybrid cross, talks about a test cross, sex determination, environmental fluctuations and phenotypes. So this is almost more of a little bit of a study guide. In addition to um, that, there is this problem down here. Um, and it says something about extra credit on the next test. Um, and I don't know how I'm able to do that because I can't really collect your, your dweebs. So you can disregard that, but you should look at the sheet. Okay, look at this sheet and you should be able to work these problems now. You should be able to work any of the genetics problems on any of the sheets at this point because we have made it through. So what about the next test and when will it open up? Well, we will finish up our lecture on Wednesday. We'll have a live lecture. Um, and then I guess on that Friday, we'll open up the test. And we're, that'll put us about a week ahead of schedule, which is beautiful. We don't want to be behind. We want to be ahead so that at the end, we're like, we're done. And there's still a week left. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? May not work out quite like that, but... but uh, We'll be, we'll be ahead of the game, okay, folks? All right, well, um, I hope that was a useful exercise. I, I know it was, it will be for sure when we have the test. Uh, and um, I hope that uh, 